Hello and welcome back to the Pro and Predictions podcast. I am Paul O'Dea and I am the amateur side. And on the professional side, we have Bellator bantamweight contender Brian the Pikeman Moore. On today's episode, we are going to look at the UFC 257 card happening this Saturday in Abu Dhabi and predict the outcomes of those bouts. How are you doing, Brian? I'm all good, Paul. I'm a bit cold, but uh, other than yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. We, we were debating whether Brian should put a hat on because of the shine on his forehead, but... Uh, I, I, the, the it's hair... a bit shiny, but I have this... <laughs> yeah, the hair got the better of you in the end. Yeah, I was training, and every time I throw a punch, my fringe would keep hitting me in the eyes, so I said, right, enough of this shit. We're going to be in lockdown for long enough, so... I became the razor. She's a done, done job now, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> if you say so. I'll, I'll take your word it's on gro- it. It's growing on me. It's growing <laughs> on me. <laughs> um, so look, obviously, excitement this week ahead of Conor McGregor's return, being a teammate of yours. There must be some massive excitement in the camp and looking forward to what kind of, uh, he says, it's going to be a masterpiece. Um, mm-hmm. Look, obviously, we'll get into that fight in a while, but just a little bit. How excited are you for his return? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm excited for any time Conor is fighting, but when you see him in this kind of a mindset, how, you know, uh, he's enjoying the training and uh, just how confident he is, you know, that's what makes me excited. Um, Even the way Dana White put it, the way uh, way Conor is, is when he turns up, um, excited to fight, we know what we're going to be in for. It's going to be a masterpiece. So I cannot wait for this. And uh, it's, it's so interesting because I was looking at the press conference today and everybody kept, you know, the same narrative. You, you've achieved so much kind of almost to say, why are you doing this? Yeah. And he's doing it for the love of the sport. This man has made enough money for him, his kids and his kids' kids, but he's here to do it because of he, what draw, draw him to the sport in the first place, which was love. And, and I cannot wait to see a, a fully energized 155 fully motivated Connor and it's, it's anytime we do we see the best it's a show artist of all time in my opinion oh yeah, yeah. And he, he touched so. he touched on that a little bit during the presser as well that people need yeah. to stop asking why he's there it's for the love of the sport and nothing else mm. and I mean I don't I think any it. I don't think anyone can argue with that with the money that he has made there is no other motivation other than competing driving him to beat her that's where we all started MMA because there was no career as such. You know, it was literally just to see how far we could go, how we would fare off in, a, in unarmed combat against another person. There was no big paychecks back then when we first got into it. It was just just to test our metal. And, you know, uh, <laughs> he's one of the reasons why we can all make a living and a wage now out of the sport too. So we're back. To be, we're back to uh, almost square one here uh, of the reason why Connor's getting in there. And that's again, love for the sport. So it's going to be phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. He has a great opponent on, on, on his hands. So, yeah. you know, you look at Dustin Poirier and, and the work he's done, especially since the loss to Connor, since he went back up to 155, the fights, the wars he's been in. We are in for a, for a treat. So I can't wait. Yeah, fully agree. Before we get into the UFC 257 card, it would be remiss of me not to mention our picks from last week and to give an update. Not very good. Not very good. No. Brian is putting up his hood and covering his face. But I, I, I can't say anything. We both went three and four for the seven fights we picked on last week. Uh, we both had Holloway and Chiesa, and I had Condit, you had Punahele. Um, yeah, so pressure's on. Pressure's on to do well this week. Pressure is on. Um, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever started a year on a losing record. So, yeah. And both of our no. bets of the well, week as well were, well, mine, mine missed out by one. Yours was appalling. If I can just throw that in there. You're clinging, <laughs> you're, you're clutching at straws there. I'm very much clutching at straws, falling. yeah, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Well, look, it, uh, it was fucking nuts, wasn't it? Let's nah, be honest. Yeah. You know, it, the, 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 the Buckley fight, now beautiful knockout, but he was on the receiving end of it this time. Um, you know, it was it was crazy. It was fucking crazy. Uh, but it was a brilliant fight card. What a way to kick off 2020. Our picks mightn't have been the correct, but uh, we'll, we'll bounce back, Paul. We'll bounce back. Hopefully, anyway, we need to save some face this week. Um, <laughs> so looking ahead to the 257 card, and before we get into the main card, there are some, like, top to bottom, it's a very good card, and you look down through the prelims, there's some interesting ones there. Is there any fights that you've 
kind of earmarked as ones to watch and ones not to miss on that card? Yeah, look, it's it's a great card. When we get to the main card, it's wow, especially the co-main and main. There are some sleepers though on the on the prelims that that I'll be very interested. We've Brad Tavares versus Carlos Junior. That's a great fight. Even yeah. Carlos Junior explained that it's a striker versus grappler. That are always uh, that's an always an interesting dynamic. But Brad Tavares has been around forever now at this stage, and he's always a gritty. He's a vet at this stage as well, seventy yeah. six. So. And then just below that, we've Sarah McCann and Julia Pena. So uh, really good. I love seeing Sarah McCann uh, with her background in particular and what she what she brings to the octagon each time. So look at there's some clear round trees back. Nick Lentz. I always like seeing Nick Lentz in a good scrap. So yeah, he's fighting a 13 0 prospect. So look at from start to finish, it's a great card. But the the, the ones that I be that I that I want to see off the prelims is the Tavares. Uh, Carlos Jr. and then the Sarah McCann Julie, Julia Pena fight Yeah I'm of the same, same opinion two very good fights and there's some other top top prospects on that card as well to watch out for um, but I suppose without further ado we get into the main event um, you have Conor McGregor who look we all know about Conor McGregor there's very few stats that I'm going to pull up here that's going to shock anyone but the one thing to look at is the fact that both guys have made a move up to 155 in the last I suppose five years Connor between 155 and 170 since he's moved up is 3 and 2 in those divisions since it since the move and preceding that was a 15 fight win streak that was at between featherweight and lightweight outside of the UFC Dustin Poirier since he's moved up is 6 and 1 with one no contest in his last day 10 2 10 2 losses and one no contest overall since he's moved up but 6 and 1 and one no contest in his last eight so it, it He's obviously been more active, but he has looked that bit more impressive at this weight class, ba- just based on the stats. And if you look at some common opponents as well, obviously you have Khabib. We won't get into that too much. They were almost identical fights. You have, going back to the featherweight days, you have Holloway. Both guys decisioned him once. Dustin Poirier also subbed him, of course, at featherweight. You have Alvarez, who both guys KO'd, but Dustin also had that no contest against and then go if you want to go way back, you have Diego Brando, who both guys KO'd at featherweight. And Duffy, surprisingly, comes on to both lists. Of course, famously subbed Connor early, early in his career, and Dustin Poirier got a decision against him in the UFC. Now, I mean, obviously, it's, it, it's a little bit different to what the stats are reading there, and it, it's easy to look at that and say that Dustin is, is the more natural lightweight, but I don't think that's the case. I'd, I, I'd imagine you agree. Absolutely, yeah. Connor has fought how many times at lightweight? Twice. In, Twice in the, in, UFC. The, in the UFC. Yeah, it's you have to you have to take into consideration he was a phenomenal featherweight. He wasn't going to just leave the division, and when he did, he became the champ champ. And from there, he went into boxing. Yep. The man is a you know he's you know I I think he's in his best weight class. Yep. I just think I can't wait to see him in it more. You know I. Welterweight is fine. I do like seeing him at welterweight, and not having to cut is always a good thing. But I cannot wait to see him at one fifty five and to cement his, you know, his home at that weight class yeah. and to become champ. I think if you look back at the fights that you mentioned, <clears throat> I would strongly disagree with one thing that you said, and that's the Khabib fight where yeah. you said they were identical. They may be technically identical on, uh, you know, the the, the, the rounds and and outcome yes but mm. they were two very different fights yeah. um Khabib had his way with Poirier halfway through the first round onwards while Connor took rounds if yeah. one if, if not two rounds off of Khabib and that was him an, an ill prepared Connor yeah so you know and look at fight styles make fights it's very it, MMA math does not make sense but if you look at the other fights Eddie Alvarez it was a back and forth slow fest yeah. Connor's uh, again against Eddie Alvarez was probably the greatest performance in a title fight of all time so you know we go back and forth um, with that you know how everybody did against opponents but MMA mad is bullshit <laughs> we're going to find out on Sunday morning the real outcome and, uh, but look you've got two phenomenal competitors absolutely yeah. phenomenal competitors for me the biggest difference is how clinic, clinical they are now yeah. we got Dustin Poirier it's very technical but from his early days to right up to his last fight with Dan Hooker, 
He loves getting into brawls. Yeah. You look at his uh, earlier career before the UFC even, he was hooks and rolls, hooks and rolls, ducks and, and hooks, um, fought, fighting a short range and loving to get into these brawls. Connor yeah. is far, far more technical. He'll, he'll pick shots and he's well able to fight in the pocket. I, I know that from personal experience, but um, I just think he's more clinical. Yeah, I think that'll be the. I think that will be the separation of both men. Um, Dustin Poirier has blessed us with phenomenal fights. You know when you're going to turn on the on to on the TV and Poirier's fight, you know you're going to be entertained. But um, I just think that Connor has just too much firepower and its accuracy is just something else. So I think he'll clip him. I think that's the way I can see it going. Yeah, um, it's it's funny you should mention about. Uh, Part, the difference between the fights and the Alvarez fight is kind of the example I would point to. Um, and again, like you say, MMA Matt is absolute bullshit. Um, mm-hmm. If you look at Poirier's style since he's moved up to lightweight, it has, it's been explosive, but he's been in wars in nearly every fight he's won. And he's got clipped or hurt or at least touched up a little bit in almost every fight. Um, whereas McGregor, on the other hand, tends to kind of dominate when the fight is on the feet. I think if Pori has any yeah. chance in this fight, he's got to engage in grappling. And and even at that, I, I think, not that he'd be outgunned, but it's a tough match for him on the mat as well. Yeah, Connor's grappling is ridiculously underrated. He's an excellent grappler and beautiful wrestling, excellent jiu-jitsu. The one thing that um that, that when you look at Poirier's style and you even listen to Poirier's camp is uh you were perfectly right what you said in the sense that when he's in a fight he does get touched um now it's a fight it happens yeah. but he does take shots um he's brilliant at just getting the head off the center enough to not take too much damage and and give back twos and threes and like he outvolumed Max Holloway when they fought which is crazy. He's really good in that sense of putting pressure, putting pressure, putting pressure. And then I heard um, his camp, his boxing coach, speak about uh, putting Connor on the back foot, you know, going after Connor um, and putting pressure on him. He's the best counter puncher in yeah. MMA without a shadow of a doubt. So putting pressure on a man who's, who, who is just setting traps continuously and, and every second of that fight, noting your tendencies, it's a dangerous, dangerous game. And, uh, that's um that could that could be a, a a massive downfall for Poirier, yeah. That's how I see it playing out. Now, if Poirier stands and lets Connor come to him, he has that huge reach advantage or huge reach disadvantage, should I say? Yeah. So either way on the feast, it's not going to be a nice night for Poirier, in my opinion. Uh love Poirier, I think he's phenomenal, but I think he's outclassed on the feet in this. Now, the grappling is is Poirier's an excellent grappler. Connor is an excellent grappler. I'd love to see those grappling exchanges too. But um, yeah, look at, I can see so many paths to victory for Connor, but I can't see them for Pori. Yeah, um, I've, I've just a quick stat for you there given to us by Andy Hickey, MMA of the MMA opinion as well. Um, so Pori, since the McGregor fight and since the move up to lightweight, has absorbed 1,059 strikes and has only been dropped once. In the McGregor fight, Poirier, or McGregor landed nine times before dropping Poirier. Now, peop- people are touching on the fact that his chin has improved and that the, the extra weight has helped him with his, his endurance and his cardio. But I just think that that's a power thing. I think McGregor just has his number in that regard that if he does hit him and connect clean, it could be a very similar story to the last day. Yeah, and like when we talk about power, if we were all to go on to that, you know, that punch bag that gives you the score, we're all going to score good. What gives Connor his power is his timing and his accuracy. You know what I mean? He uses his leverage just phenomenally well because he's done more rounds than, than I know. Uh, when I first moved up to SBG, Connor was a boxing coach. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he, was, he was obviously an MMA fighter, but he had taken time out and he was coaching boxing. Um, but the class was warm up, shadow box, and then spar. So even back then, when he wasn't competitive, he was constantly sparring. The man loves it, but um, he's done so much rounds that his timing is just unbeatable. Yeah, and that's what gives him his power. Yes, he's a ph- phenomenal athlete. Yes, he 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 does have excellent power, but he he knows 
the, the, he knows the points where to hit. You know, you look at his his fights against Ivan Bushinger. You know, uh, and across the chin, getting that that turn of the head. You look at the Eddie Alvarez. You know, onto the temple, onto the chin. He's just so accurate. His timing is unbelievable, and I think that's the difference. Yeah. Yes, Poirier has absorbed over a thousand strikes, but how many of them were clean? Yeah. And that's what we're so used to seeing with Conor, just those clean, accurate strikes. And of course, uh, famously, Conor McGregor, the, the left hand that he hides behind his shoulder is probably one of his most lethal strikes, the one where he moves you away to his right and then follows the left yeah. hand over his own shoulder. And it's always the mm. punch you don't see coming. Um, yeah, look, I, I'd just be interested to see if, if because... Our own Liam Oak here from the MMA Opinion Podcast has predicted that this will be over in 30 seconds. And he said, according to Embedded, Conor McGregor has picked out the, the hook, spinning hook kick. I can honestly see Poirier coming out and engaging, first off, disengaging completely for the first 20 to 30 seconds. And then maybe trying to wrestle with McGregor a little bit, even in, in the clinch, but just to make it dirty for the first round, just to try and drag it out a bit. Yeah, I could see him wanting to. Uh, I could see him wanting to get into them, their, those pockets and dirty box. But yeah. now you have a guy who's broken orbitals with shoulders, so you got these yeah. things to worry about. He's crea- he's creative from everywhere. Um, what I can see, and I said this um, on another podcast, what I see happening is is something very similar to the last fight because old habits die hard. Yeah. Of Poirier ducking, I watched that knockout dozens of times and I yeah. still can't quite figure out where it's like the top or the back of the ear as Poirier goes down but he found that he found that um, that that gap Connor that he needed Yeah, I think he's going to get the uppercut this time I think as Poirier dips I think Connor comes up with that left uppercut and, and whether he catches him and, and, and that's it or whether he follows up with strikes after I can see that being um, being the, the shot that lands but the man has a, a deep Arsenal to, to yeah. pick from so the spin hooky could well be there I'd love to see it I'd surely so would you, love to see you're it you're predicting something akin to the Marcus Brimage knockout I suppose with the, the uppercuts leading to strikes similar but not so much moving back yeah. I think I can see Connor putting a bit of pressure Poirier shelling and not too much footwork involved and, and, and catching him clean rather than when he was fighting Brimage he was back and angling with the uppercuts was, was just perfect but I can see it more of a solid feet to the floor Big uppercut coming um, to Poirier. Just the way Poirier fights, that style of his. And uh, it, either way, it's going to be unbelievable. I can't wait to see how this one plays out. Nobody, I, I can't see anybody uh, picking Poirier, which, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it because I'm a teammate of Connor. <laughs> I, want, I want Connor to win. But, um, you know, it's, it's when you look at his resume, and I still have yet to see one person pick him. Yeah. It's, it's a bit crazy. It's just it's uh, it just goes to show, you know, when the belief that people have in Connor when he turns up the way he's uh, he's the way he's talking right now. Yeah, and I suppose it, it, it's about that time we make our picks. And in the interest of fairness, I'll go first this week, so you're not accusing me of stealing all your picks. Um, <laughs> my my prediction will be Connor McGregor, but I reckon it will be the last minute of the first round. Are the first two minutes of the second round. Okay. By KO. Mm-hmm. I like that pick. I didn't like Liam's pick of the what thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. That's like <laughs> that game or yeah. He heard Connor, so he said, "I'll just go a little bit beneath yeah. him." So. <laughs> Mystic Liam. No, yeah. um, well, I, listen. If if yeah. it comes off, I, I I think he's I think he's thinking about putting money on the first thirty seconds. Wonder oh, what odds he get. There you go. I had, I'm sure you get decent enough odds for 30 seconds. Um, yeah, I can see it first round. What minute, I'm not sure. But don't forget, there's one big important thing. That octagon is smaller in Fight Island, um, if I'm not mistaken. Anytime I see it, it looks smaller anyway. So these guys are almost made to, to engage that little bit more. Um, no, the octagon think, in Abu Dhabi is the 30-foot octagon. It's the one in the apex in Las Vegas that's the smaller octagon. So it is actually the larger octagon that they have in the Etihad Arena. Oh, apologies. Well, then, you know, like you said, um, you think Poirier might try to disengage for a little bit. I think that might be a little bit of a wise move just to see trim may- maybe no tendencies Connor has given. But I think Connor's going to go straight to the target, similar to yeah. how he started with Cowboy. 
Yeah. Maybe a little bit more uh, tentative, but I think he's going to be pretty direct. The man is 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 full of confidence. You can see that in him. You can you can hear that in every interview that he gives. I think he's going to go out and try land direct shots and look to counter what Poirier gives back and um, or make him shell up and pay. But uh, yeah, if I had to give my prediction, I think it'll be, I think two minutes into the first round. Very good. And we could talk about the main event all day long and and I'm sure we'll sit down at some point and talk even more about it. But we have to move yeah, on to the sure. co-main event of the evening, which is another phenomenal fight at lightweight. And this 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 one... Being a Bellator fighter yourself, it must be interesting to see this crossover. You have Michael Chandler making his debut appearance against a very tough Dan Hooker. Now, the one thing I will say, Dan Hooker is 3-2 and two in his last five. And again, another man that gets embroiled in wars. And I, I, I just look back to that Barbosa fight, and that's the only time he's been finished. Now, the, di- the difference, obviously, between Barbosa and Chandler... Barbosa is prominently a striker, but the blueprint is there on how to beat Dan Hooker at the same time. Um, how how do you fit? How do you think Chandler will fare with the with the move over? There's definitely great fights for him. I just think this is a very difficult fight straight off the bat. And is he capable of beating Hooker? Absolutely. I think this is going to be fight tonight without a shadow of a doubt. You know, I think we talked about the main event. I think that's going to be a clinical performance. We're going to have a highlight reel to look back at for. For and we're old men, but this one is going to be fighting. I think this one is is probably going to be close to fight of the year. Yeah, you know we have two very different body types, two very different fighters. Um, you have Chandler, who's an excellent wrestler, who's a powerhouse, who can box very well, and a phenomenal athlete. Yeah, you got Hooker, who's very wily on the feet. He, yes, his his um his record. You said three and two. If you look at Barbosa fight, he's improved a lot in those yeah. last four fights, even when he lost to Poirier. He's fighting cleaner. Yeah. He, he's, he, if he can use his distance, use his feints, I think that he's going to have success at picking Chandler apart. But I think Chandler wanting to make a big impression, yeah. especially from the press conference. We can see it's those four guys being talked about. I think he's going to come out um, straight out of the traps. He's going to want to put pressure on, on Hooker. And I think he could either catch him cold or Hooker could bring up that knee up the middle and catch Chandler. So I think it would be a back and forth war. This is what I predict for this one. Um, how do you see it going? Yeah, so look, t- touching on both of their styles, I honestly think Chandler moving in, this is one of the toughest fights he could have got right off the bat, like yeah. you. Like you look at their records, Chandler in 21 wins has nine KOs and seven subs. And Dan Hooker, who's maybe of late known as a striker, Dan Hooker has 10 KO wins in his 20 wins, but seven subs as well. Now, yeah. the, one, the one thing with Hooker is that knee that he throws straight up the middle is vicious. And he yeah. tends to snatch at necks very quickly if people go for mm. single or double legs in, in the center of the cage. Against the it's, cage, it's I see it as an opportunity. Dangly, yeah. But again, against the cage, I see an opportunity for Chandler to take him down. But in, in the open, I think it's a very dangerous tactic for, for Chandler to be trying to take him down. Um, it, it's a, Like you say, though, I, Dan Hooker has been known now for the guy that's in the wars. And look at last year, two candidates in fight of the year candidates. Um, so it could be a good shout that this one be fight of the year. I think so, but if Hook, Hooker needs to play this one smart, he has... We, we, you, you touched on his submission wins. He's, he has he's a beautiful dar submission win there. Uh, he's, he's those long levers. But if he can use those long levers on the feet, he's going to have more success. Um, yeah. He should be keeping. He should be fainting. He should be jabbing. And he knows this. I think that's what he's going to try and do. But he's and also a guy who gets emotionally involved. And when there's a, when there's a scrap there, he often jumps at the opportunity to get yeah. involved. And, um, you know... I do think he's a better striker than Chandler. Yeah. Chandler's a better wrestler. So who can impose their game plan? Will Chandler want to wrestle? Yeah. I think he will. I think he'll want to do everything. Um, he'll want to show his complete game. Yeah. But can he get the takedowns on on Hooker, who's, who, who is very difficult to take down? The knee up the middle is the big one for me. Uh, we have Chandler who, who throws the overhand with the head low, who shoots 
very fast but very low, obviously. So will Hooker bring that up and exploit that in the middle? Another thing is Hooker fights very upright. So he's he's uh, susceptible to overhands himself. So, I mean, there's so many ways this fight can play out. That's why I'm so so excited to see it. But uh, fight of the night, possibly fight of the year. Um, if if there was going to be a clear cut winner, it'll happen if either Hooker plays it smart and plays it long, or Chandler can get the takedown. But you know, it's it's. I'm gonna pick my winner in a sec after you. Yeah. But uh, I'm not gonna put my I'm not gonna put my money on this one. I, yeah. If I was to put my money on it, it'll be for fight of the night. Yeah. So my prediction for this one, and it's a bit out there, right? So the the, the pressure's obviously on Chandler. <laughs> my my picks are always out there. Let's be fair. Always out there. Yeah. I, I I I see these mad sequences in my head, and they never come true. But uh, Chandler obviously <laughs> has been kind of plugging his his case for our, the Khabib fight, and he's saying. American NCAA wrestling versus uh, Russian sambo wrestling, and that's that's his narrative that he's trying to spin. So I can see him trying to go to that that grappling, yeah. and trying to lean heavy on the grappling to show that he's the dominant wrestler now in the lightweight division in the absence of Khabib. What I see happening is, again from the open, I don't see him just running for a double leg or a single leg. If he gets gets it against the cage, he's ver- very good chance of taking Dan Hooker down. But what I see is Dan Hooker loves a leg kick. I see Chandler trying to catch a leg kick and taking him down. And I actually see Dan Hooker submitting him. Mm, so I, I think I think Hooker by submission in maybe the second or third round. That's crazy. You are right. That is crazy. <laughs> I think you are right, though. If you look at um, Chandler's stance, it's a very wide stance. And that's where he's able to develop power. Yeah. And uh, that does leave you susceptible to leg kicks. I know I have a wide stance and in my last fight, that's what I've been working on since, is just to try to narrow that stance back. Because I had leg kicks in that one. But um, yes, I do understand what you're saying. He could get that fr- from that. But if Hooker can keep it low, he could get some success and try to tr- uh, slow Chandler down. Um, for me... I think it's going to be a decision. I think it's going to be a decision. Um, now, Chandler could knock him out with an overhand right. Chandler could take him down and, and pound him out. Hooker could knock him out with a with a, with a stiff right hand or a right knee. This could go many ways. But I'm going to go with a bloody, crazy 15-minute decision. And I'm going to pick I'm going to pick Hooker to come out on top. As much as I, I'd like to see Chandler, I wouldn't be surprised if it went either way. I'm yeah. just... Something is telling me Hooker... He has the experience in the octagon. I'm not saying that um, Chandler can't live up to the hype because he's he's shown that time and again, especially his first fight with Eddie Alvarez. Just something is telling me to put to 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 to, to go with Hooker on this one. No problem. And moving on to the next fight, we have the women uh, just before the co-main. We have Jessica I versus Joanne Calderwood, and this this for me is a phenomenal fight as well. Both girls are coming off tough losses, uh, Jessica to Cynthia yeah. Cavillo and Calderwood to uh, Jennifer Moya. But both are still trying to get that to that number one contender in the 25 division, and they're both so close to it. You have Jessica, who's 4-2 and two since the move down to 125. Joanne Calderwood is 3-2 and two in her last five. But they both have big wins down there. Jessica is beaten Arujo. She's beaten um, Chukagian. She's lost to the champion there already. I know that that plays a factor when you're looking for a rematch. Um, I, ju- I, I honestly just think Jessica I has a little bit too much for Joanne Calderwood at this time. Um, so I, I will be leaning towards I taking a decision in this one. Yeah, I I look, I look, agree with what you're saying with Jessica I being that probably a little bit much. But, and, and if you look at one of her losses, it's to Shevchenko, one of the pound-for-pound pound best fighters in the world right now. Yeah. But Joanne Calderwood, I just want Joanne Calderwood to come out with a throw a little bit more caution to the wind. Yeah, and definitely. Come out and show us what she is capable of. The Jojo of old. Oh, it was unbelievable. Before she got into the UFC, I could not wait to see this lady fight because Jesus, she used to throw everything. Right. And less caution. Some some fighters need to be reined back in and fight that little bit more intelligent and maybe not look for so much volume. While other fighters do their best work when they're Putting, they're, they're thinking less and letting the body just do. Yeah, uh, you seen Holloway the other night. There was no thinking there. There was just go, go, go. He was his offset or off-timed rhythms. I think if Calderwood could just 
let it go in a little bit more. I think she could frighten a lot of people here and I think she could finish Jessica I. That being said, if Jessica I with the form she's been in versus Calderwood with the form she's been in, I do see Jessica I taking a decision on this one. So you're you're Jessica with a decision as well? Yeah, but I'm I'm hoping that yeah. Calderwood comes out all guns blazing, ready to throw caution to the wind, looking for that finish, looking for that devastating mood tie that we had seen before she got into the UFC. Um, and we've seen glimpses of it. It's not that not as if she's she's pushed it away. We've seen it in 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 big glimpses. But I want to see her going out. Um, she's she's improved technically, but I want that mindset back of of going forward and looking for the finish. And I think if she does that, she'll get the win. But I'm going to lean on Jessica Oye here based on on past form uh, to come out with on top of the, with the decision. So we're in agreement on all three so far. And now we get to the fight before that. You have the lightweight bout between. Exciting young prospect Otman Azaitar versus Matt Frivola. And we talked about this a little bit earlier about the movement of Frivola yeah. and the difficulties he's going to bring to Azaitar, who's known for his knockout power. Um, so Azaitar, 13 and 0, 2 and 0 so far in the UFC. But outside of that, he went 4 and 0 before that in Brave. Um, and, and Brave is one of the tougher organizations um, to be picking up consistency and, and consistent wins outside of the UFC. Um, one of the smaller promotions, I mean. So in his 13 fights, 13 wins, 11 kills, one sub, and he's going in against Matt Frivola, who, for all intents and purposes, has a lot of experience, but I just think he's outgunned in this one. He's 2-1-1 one, and one in the UFC after his Dana White Contender Series sub win, and his only loss was a KO to Polo Reyes as well, and that worries me. I think Azaitar can put him to sleep here, and I think he gets it done in the first round. Yeah, I fully agree. It's either is a high level striker, and uh, Matt Favola is is possibly more well rounded. I just think it's either with the craftiness of his striking game comes out and puts Favola out. Now, Favola, his key to victory, he's got to mix it up. He's got to mix it up. Um, too often do I see guys. Maybe it's because of um. You know, trying to maintain or try to not wear their gas tank out. They shoot and then they give up if they don't get it. He needs to keep going. He needs to keep uh, as either guessing on what level for Vola is going to go. Is he going to strike? Is he going to go for uh, takedowns? He can't just stand with him because it's going to be an early night, uh, unfortunately for him. But I, I do think as either, you know, uh, puts the pressure on him, cuts the cage off, and and gets the knockout. Yeah, and touching on the opening fight of the main card, I do just got to push you just for a pick on this one. You have Marina Rodriguez, 12-1-2 in the UFC against Amanda Rebas, 10-1. and one. Amanda's on a five-fight win streak as opposed to Marina, who's had two tough draws, two close draws, one loss and two wins in her last five since Dana White Contender Series. Um, but she's, t- she's fought tougher opposition for me. Um, I, I, I would just lean with Amanda Rebas. I think the size is there, and I just think Amanda Rebas gets it done by decision. Paul, we're agreeing on all five. Can you believe that? I'm going to go with Rebus as well. I think just after her last big win of, uh, against Van Zandt, I think she's just going to be you know, brimming with confidence going into this. And I think she gets the job done. Um, I'm going to go with decision on this. I'm leaning I'm leaning to a decision, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a submission. But I'm going to go with, with a decision to, for Rebus in this. Perfect, and we will move on to our bets of the week. This is my favourite part of the week. So for anyone that's following myself and Brian, you're already down a tenner. We're looking to save face this week. Um, I will go first. My bet of the week is Conor McGregor to win by KO and Otman Azaitar to win by KO. It's a double. It's very low priced, but I think it's a very safe bet to get my money back. I've stolen uh, your exactly. bet, haven't I? Yeah, you have. <laughs> you fucker. Um, yeah, look, at I, I think it's a, they are safe bets, even though we are looking for a KO. Um, you know what, Paul? I want to be a better sport here. I want to give uh, people a bit of choice. Um, <laughs> look, at I think they're two good bets, but I'm going to change it up for the crack, okay? I'm going to go with Connor to win by KO. So you're picking Dustin Poirier goal. by KO and Matt Frivola by KO, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm going to go with Connor first round knockout. First round knockout. I'm going to go with, yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to go with 
uh, wins. I'm not going to pick method. I'm not going to pick rounds. I'm going to pick wins for Dan Hooker, Jessica I, and and the Zeter. So I'm going to pick those three on top of a Conor McGregor knockout. Woof. So four way back. Yeah, well, look, you robbed mine, so I had to fucking do something. I had to improvise, <laughs> didn't I? Well, look, <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it comes off, you're, you're in the money. Definitely in yeah. the money. I, look, I almost want to lose because I want Joanne Calderwood to win, but I think the safest bets is, uh, is Conor McGregor and Azita to win. Yeah. Uh, Dan Hooker and Chandler, like I said. Um, you know, another great bet would be for McGregor knockout and Hooker and Chandler to be fighting in a night. But uh, I'm going to go with McGregor to win. Uh, sorry, McGregor for knockout. Dan Hooker to win. Jessica Oye to win. And Azita to win. Nice. It should be a good one. Um, tune in to us again next week where we're going to break down the 257 card and we look at some fights that might be happening over the next couple of weeks. Obviously, there's no UFC card next week, but we'll get into some other stuff. There's a heavyweight bout coming up shortly on February 6th. Um and we appreciate you tuning in. Is there anything you want to touch on before we go, Brian? Yeah, look, there's going to be a lot of Irish watching this, obviously. There's going to be millions around the world watching it because of Conor McGregor. But uh, yes, obviously, you're, we're going to be looking at a fantastic main uh, car, main event. But make sure you check out that that uh, co-main and the rest of the fights on it as well. You, you, you won't be sorry, let's put it that way. Perfect. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Brian, for coming on. And we will see you again next week. Like and subscribe, folks.